Why do you think Malthus has continued to be so controversial? Well, I think because he addresses a question which is clearly uh, an important question and has become an even more important question in poor countries since the Second World War, the question of the relationship between population and resources. He addresses it in a very direct way and gives a very clear and direct answer to it, at least in the first essay, that there simply is a race between the numbers of people and the food available to feed those people, a race in which population is always ahead. That's clearly why he continues to be so controversial. And I think it's the simplicity of the message, together with the situation that people see, at least at first sight in the third world, uh, which has continued to keep him in view as the focus of the argument about the relation between population and resources. What extent would you say Malthus's theory is applicable in India today? Well, in principle, Malthus's theory is applicable in India, as it's applicable in principle to any poor society, most of whose economic production is in agriculture, with a large population. Prima facie, one can take the theory to the situation and ask whether the increase in the rate of production of food uh, is ahead of or behind the rate of increase in the population. If one does that to India, one finds, in general, over the period since independence, that the rate of increase in the production of food across the country, taken in the long run, is always slightly ahead of the rate of increase in the population. So that seen from that very simple Malthusian point of view, looking at India as a whole, the situation is not so severe. However, I think that the theory is too simple, and to look at one large nation as one large indivisible unit is also uh, too simple. The theory is too simple because it takes no account, as many commentators have pointed out, Marx among others, is too simple because it takes no account of the various ways in which food can be produced, that's to say the various relations of production in agriculture. It takes no account of different possible mechanisms of distribution of the agricultural product. And on the other hand, of course, it makes its notorious although theoretically very clear and for that reason very useful, its notorious assumptions about a fixed rate of population increase. If one looks more closely at the Indian situation, both since independence and in the years before, one finds that the situation is indeed much more complicated. There are indeed parts of India where the production of food is behind the rate of increase in population or has from time to time been behind the rate of increase in population. So that if one were to take those areas and separate them from the rest of the country, then it looks as though they're in a Malthusian trap. But if one looks more closely at those areas, for example, as Amartya Sen has done at the Bengal famine in 1943, one finds that the problem is not simply one of starvation. It's not simply one of too many people and too little food. It's also a problem of the way in which that food uh, is produced, and above all, of the way in which it's distributed. It's the relationship between uh, the market for food and the production of food that is so crucial. But of course, one can't take small areas of India in isolation uh, any more sensibly than one can take uh, the whole country as an indivisible unit, because relations between regions are also crucial. and. I think that once one begins to look at that set of relationships, then it's altogether a more complicated question of whether Malthus is right or wrong for India. There are areas in which the production uh, is below population. There are areas in which the production is above it. But there are areas <coughs> in the worst situation where food does come in from other areas, where the, the market is such that uh, that is possible and it can be bought, there are areas, on the other hand, in which it's not the case. And so the more one homes in on particular uh, areas of the country, the more one homes in on particular crops, the more one homes in on particular periods in the economic history of the country, the more complicated the relations become. In all cases, it seems to me that to think about them still in terms of a simple relation between uh, 
the rate of production of food on the one hand and the rate of increase in population on the other is to think about it too simply. Family planning campaigns in India have often failed. Do you think that family planning is a feasible way of approaching the population problem in India? Well, the first thing I'd like to say in answer to that question is that the way in which they've failed and the extent to which they've failed, or the way in which they're seen to have failed and the extent to which they've been seen to fail, is very largely a function, I think, of very exaggerated expectations at the beginning as to how they would proceed and what would count as success. It is true that some of the earliest ones failed, and I think they failed by taking a very simple, if I may say, Malthusian view, namely that there was already considerable population pressure in this country. It was clearly increasing because mortality was going down, fertility was remaining high. It must be the case that poor people want fewer children. All that we have to do is to introduce the means with which they can achieve this, and they will do so. The assumption was too simple, the expectation was too high, and the failure, accordingly, was seen as enormous. But I think, over time, a greater wisdom uh, has come upon people involved in the family planning campaign in India, as in other countries. First of all, it's become clear from a variety of studies, Mamdani's famous reply to the Kana study, and a variety of studies since the early 1970s, on the whole more scholarly, more careful, more patient, more detailed studies than Mamdani, it's become clear that there are advantages to certain groups of poor Indians, both in the countryside and in the towns, in, if not having enormous numbers of children, then certainly not reducing their fertility to that figure, two or three, uh, which family planners would regard as a success. Now, what these advantages are, uh, is something that it's very difficult to generalize about. But I think if one does generalize about them, then one can say two things. First of all, there are situations, classically the situation, I think, of the marginal cultivator in India. That's to say, a person perhaps on a sharecropping tenancy who has no access to credit and therefore can't use any of the inputs uh, that are available to a richer farmer for improving his output has to rely upon labor, is too poor to rely upon anything else but family labor, and consequently is tremendously dependent upon the production of children to keep his enterprise going. And moreover, it's the case that as a result of uh, agrarian change in India over the last 20 or 30 years, the proportion of marginal cultivators in the country has increased spectacularly, and it's now uh, somewhere over 50% of all households living in the countryside. So the, there, is no, there is a simple economic advantage to these people in having children, and that's come, become to be seen to be clear. Secondly, for those people and for others, most of the time, even if there is not a clear economic advantage in having children, there may be, at some crucial moment of crisis, an advantage in having children, particularly when the prospective parents are themselves old, in a society where the only source of welfare, in essence, is the kin system. Uh, if you don't produce a kin system, you don't get any welfare. There is no security. And so it's come very clearly to appear to people working in family planning that there is very little hope of promoting it successfully in populations where parts of the population, where the demand for labor is high and where the conditions of life are extremely insecure, where risks are very extreme. Mead Cain's work in Bangladesh, for example, shows that over against work that others have done in the more secure agricultural conditions of Maharashtra. Nevertheless, some of the family planning campaigns have succeeded and have begun to succeed more. And the question is, why? Are there lessons that can be learned? Well, I think that, I think that there are and there aren't. If one takes, for example, the Indian state in which it's most conspicuously successful now, which is Kerala, one can see certain conditions there which make one believe that family planning of that kind, if instituted elsewhere in India, could work, and certain conditions which are much more peculiar to Kerala, much more idiosyncratic. Those which may occur in other parts of India are precisely to do with this question of security. But Kerala's agrarian structure is a rather unusual one. There aren't large landlords. There isn't that degree of fierce capitalist economic competition in agriculture that there is, for example, in the northern part of the country, 
Accordingly, there's much more security among those who do have land. And secondly, that there is, very unusually for India, a very good welfare system, most especially in health and education, so that infant mortality is very low, the probability of any child surviving is very high. Access to education in Kerala is now fairly easy. On the other hand, Kerala is historically a culturally rather, un rather particular area of India, long Christian influence. It has historically a very high literacy rate, and particularly a very high literacy rate among women. There are social and cultural characteristics in Kerala which are distinctively Kerala, and which don't occur as well in the country. And the extent to which they've facilitated the success of the family planning program is something which, in the nature of the case, is very difficult to determine. But it seems to me that Kerala is not so peculiar, uh, it's not so different from the rest of India in all respects, as to make one believe that uh, family planning uh, couldn't succeed, albeit family planning conceived more modestly than it's been conceived in the past. But one condition which has to be met if it's going to succeed anywhere uh, is a condition which is not to do with the economic and social and cultural situation of the population into which one's trying to introduce it. It's to do with the administrative structure of the country. And it's very clear that whereas in Kerala the structure of local administration is good, that's to say it's efficient, it's relatively uncorrupt, the services, not only the family planning services, but the associated health and child care services, actually do efficiently and effectively and consistently get out into the country areas. But if one looks at other parts of India, for example at Bihar, that simply isn't the case. The administrative structure is uh, rickety, it's corrupt, the services don't get to the people. Uh, there's evidence from field studies that Piers Blakey's study, for example, of family planning in northern Bihar, there's evidence that the demand is there, but the services simply don't arrive. So I think that if one takes a more modest view of what could count as success in a family planning program, takes into account the research that's been done over the last 10 or 15 years on the conditions of the demand for children in India, and looks at those areas in which they've there have been successes, Kerala, and those areas in which there have been spectacular failures, Bihar, one can begin to put together a story of this kind which makes one moderately optimistic for the future. And after all, it is the case that nowhere in India is fertility rising. How important are cultural factors in motivating people to have large families? I've never been able to decide quite how important they are, but my inclination is to think that they're not terribly important. Let me give you some examples of facts which I've come across which have suggested to me that perhaps in the end they're much less important than material circumstances. For example, the highest abortion rate in the world in the middle of the 1970s was in urban Santiago in Chile, a largely Catholic poor population. One of the societies in the world in which male vasectomy uh, is the most demanded method of uh, contraception is in Muslim Pakistan. There are some very perplexing uh, facts which it seems to me don't correspond at least to the way in which one thinks about what these cultures are and how these cultures might bear upon ideas of reproduction. Now that may simply because, be because I've been taking too simple a view about what the relationship might be between a culture and what those in that culture uh, believe in and act upon in their reproductive behavior. But I suspect that, although I no doubt am a little simple-minded, that it also isn't quite as simple uh, at all in itself. That The first point perhaps to make is that when one identifies the culture of an Indian village, for example, what one is identifying, and it's a point now made often by anthropologists in India, what one is identifying is the culture of a group at the top of the hierarchy. Uh, the extent to which that culture is taken seriously in the sense that it actually provides a set of precepts for behavior, a set of precepts which might override material interest by those further down the hierarchy, I very much doubt. 
I suspect that the relationship is very much like the relationship between Catholicism and fertility in the West, that the only part of, the, of Western populations in Western Europe and North America in which there's a relationship between Catholicism and fertility is among uh, upper-class Catholics, rich Catholics, those, in other words, to put it crudely, who can afford to indulge their Catholicism. And I suspect that the same might be true of cultures elsewhere in the world, that those who are in a material situation where they can afford to observe the injunctions of their culture will do so. Uh, those who aren't won't. What are the prospects for the world's population? The prospects for the world's population, uh, as seen by the international agencies, for example, by the United Nations, are moderately optimistic that, depending on which, uh, which segment of the world's population one's looking at, they are for a reduction of fertility to replacement levels sooner or later in the 21st century, but in all cases by the end of the 21st century, and again in all cases, almost all cases by the end of the 21st century, uh, an equilibrium, uh, a stationary population around the world. The question is, is that whistling to keep one's spirits up, or is there any reason behind it? And I think the answer to that question is it's a bit of both. It is a bit of whistling. It must be a bit of whistling, because to contemplate the alternative is to contemplate something which is almost impossible to contemplate. But nevertheless, there are grounds for it. It is the case that the rate of increase of the world's population uh, has begun already to slow down, that when one was thinking about this subject 10 years ago, let alone 15 or 20 years ago, the prospects did look terrifying. And the increasing anxiety about the population explosion through to the end of the 60s and into the 1970s seemed to many, certainly to me, to be very justified. But since then, rates of natural increase have begun to drop. There's been, of course, the spectacular drop in China and that's not likely to be dismissed. It is, after all, a quarter of the world's population. There is also uh, the beginnings of a drop, evident now over a period of years, in India, uh, in those other societies in the world which had very high rates of fertility, Middle Eastern societies, some of the Central and Northern South American societies. Fertility rates also have begun, just begun, to, to fall. How long this will continue, it's difficult to say. But there are signs everywhere that this is beginning to happen. I think the one area of the world it, about which one can be much less sanguine is black Africa, where because rates of mortality are still so high and because of the entirely different basis of the society, where on, on the whole, if one can put it so simply, it's people who historically have always been the resource rather than material uh, qualities like land, fertility is still high. Now, even if mortality falls in Africa to levels to which it's now fallen elsewhere in the poor parts of the world, it could still be the case that for uh, economic, social, and perhaps cultural reasons, that African fertility remains very high, and so that well into the 21st century, that could be the part of the world in which there's a population explosion. Now, in the short and medium term, that may not matter for black Africa, because one of the reasons for there always having been such a high demand for people in Africa seems to be that there's always been more cultivable land than people to cultivate it. There is an enormous amount of room in that, con in that continent to expand, but clearly it's not infinite, and there will come a point where fertility falls. But then perhaps one will see the relationship between resources and population that one's beginning to see, I think, already in Asia, in China, in Indonesia, and in India, the three largest societies in the world, and also, as I've said, in the Middle East and parts of Central and Northern South America, one will begin to see uh, the rate of natural increase leveling off because the rate of fertility is falling to come more into line with fertility. So that although the official projections for a stationary population around the world by the end of the 21st century are very optimistic and do contain a large component of whistling, I think that there al there's also some rational ground.